how does one of the top agents in the country think about branding? We're going to talk about that today. Stay tuned. This episode of Keeping It Real is brought to you by Real Geeks. How many homes are you going to sell this year? Do you have the right tools? Is your website turning soft leads into interested buyers? Are you spending money on leads that aren't converting? Well, Real Geeks is your solution. Find out why agents across the country choose Real Geeks as their technology partner. Real Geeks was created by an agent for agents. They pride themselves on delivering a sales and marketing solution so that you can easily generate more business. Their agent websites are fast and built for lead conversion with a smooth search experience for your visitors. Real Geeks also includes an easy to use agent CRM. So once a lead signs up on your website, you can track their interest and have great follow-up conversations. Real Geeks is loaded with a ton of marketing tools to nurture your leads and increase brand awareness. Visit realgeeks.com forward slash keeping it real pod and find out why realtors come to Real Geeks to generate more business. Again, visit realgeeks.com forward slash keeping it real pod. And now, on to our show. Today's episode is sponsored by Virtual Staging AI. Are you looking for a cheaper and faster alternative for your virtual staging? Check out Virtual Staging AI. They offer an innovative AI staging service that gets you results in seconds and for less than $1 per picture. It's really easy to use. Just upload a picture, choose a room type, for example, a bedroom or a living room, and a furniture style like modern or farmhouse, and 30 seconds later, you get the staged result. Try it now for free at virtualstagingai.app. Again, that's virtualstagingai.app. And now, on to our show. Welcome to Keeping It Real, the largest podcast made by real estate agents and for real estate agents. My name's DJ Paris. I am your guide and host through the show. And today is our monthly series called the Monday Market Minute with Carrie McCormick from the Carrie McCormick Real Estate Group with At Properties here in Chicago. Carrie is a top, top, top 1% producer in Chicago. She has over 20 years of experience helping buyers, sellers, and investors. And I can brag for Carrie, she would never say this herself, but she was actually one of the very top producing Chicago agents for the first quarter of this year. She was technically number two, but I would say she was really number one because the number one was a developer, not like a traditional agent. So traditional agent, she was number one. That's how amazing she is. Um, she's a true superstar, an expert in everything from first-time home buyers, veteran investors, and luxury properties. She also works with a lot of developers and is often chosen to represent their high-end developments. I actually live in one of Carrie's uh, developments and I could not be happier to have to have to have learned about it because this is now where I live and I love it so much. Um, and anyone who's worked with Carrie has that same feeling. So please visit Carrie at her website, CarrieMcCormickRE.com. But most importantly, follow her on Instagram. Instagram, she does it all herself, which is even more insane. And it's so amazing, her her Instagram. It's really a great place to look to see what other realtors are doing and having success. Her Instagram is Carrie McCormick Real Estate. We'll have a link to that in the show notes. Carrie, welcome. Thank you so much. I love that intro. Reminds me of all my hard work. So thank you. Well, I love you because I live somewhere because of you, and I'm so grateful that you uh, had been like, you should come check out this thing a few years, uh, three or four <laughs> years ago, and I did, and I was like, okay, and I just yeah. that was it. So, <laughs> all right. So what's what's uh, what's going on this uh, this month? So let's talk about building your business and building a brand. We are in 2024. As DJ mentioned, I've been a broker for over 20 years. It's been a long journey. I think one um, comment a lot of new brokers or brokers that have been in the business for a few years, you know, they do ask, and I love the question is, how did you do it? How did you build your brand? How did you become successful? And I will tell you, it took a lot of patience and it took a lot of hard work. Again, you know, a few years ago, well, you know, 10 years ago, no one knew my name. You know, so it's it's taken this long to do what I've done and to build it. Um, not that I'm saying it's going to take anyone this long, but for me, it did. So I wanted just to talk a little bit about um, how I started in the business and how I got here. So I'm going to speed play, you know, 20 years 
for, for everyone to listen. And just really quick, kind of off the cuff, is I just got back from uh, Palm Beach. I just got back from um, Dallas. I'm headed to New York. I've been traveling so much to meet with other brokers in other markets, just to sit down and talk. Um, happy to, to do that with any of the listeners. If you want to get your office together, whether you come to Chicago or I travel to your office, I love sharing my stories. I love sharing my expertise. Um, so happy to do that or, you know, contact me and maybe I'm going to be um, traveling in your city next. So we'd love to meet anyone out there. Um, but just to talk about where I started. So I was in corporate America before I was in real estate. And from a very young age, my mother always told me I was a very rebel spirited child, never wanted to follow the rules, never wanted to stay in the box. So being in corporate world just wasn't my thing. You know, I was great at my job. I worked in the dot com era, which was a phenomenal um, time of my life. But again, you know, being in the office at 8 a.m., making 150 phone calls or whatever they told me to do, I really just wanted to do the opposite. So um, one day on a fluke, I was out walking. And again, I'm here in Chicago, so I was at the Aon Centers where my office was, and I walked all the way to the West Loop, which was a very hefty and long walk at the time. I stumbled upon a construction site where I um, proceeded to ask the construction workers what they were doing, what were they building. Um, I was a nuisance on the site. The manager came out and you know kindly asked me to exit the site. And we started talking and he told me, you know, we're building a, you know, I asked him what they're doing there. He said, we're building a new construction condo building. And I told him, no one is going to live here. <laughs> Why would you build a building in this neighborhood? This is a terrible neighborhood. And he was intrigued by my, um, I, I don't know, my passion about m my thought process. And I, I sat with him for just a few minutes, told him, um, you know, what my thoughts were. He asked me to meet him in his office the following week because he wanted to hear more of what I thought about this. And I think I was probably the perfect demographic at the time for the building. So I did meet with him the following week. He was a real estate developer and he hired me. So that day I quit my, my corporate job and I went into real estate. And everybody knows, you know, it's a non-paying job until you close something. So. Right. Um, but what I did is I knew in my heart, and it wasn't that I was so passionate about real estate, but I knew in my heart that, you know, the corporate world wasn't for me. I knew I was an entrepreneur at heart. I knew my hard work. I knew I could do it. So I trusted my gut and I went for it. So, you know, fast forward all of these years, you know, I, again, for the first 10 years of my career, I was in development. So I worked for some of the largest developers, successful career in the development world here in Chicago. When the market crashed, development obviously didn't, wasn't doing well. Brokerage in general wasn't doing well, but I pivoted my career and I went into general brokerage. That's when I thought I need to start building a business. And I looked at it from a business aspect. One quick story that I like to tell people, which was a huge learning curve for me, and this goes back about, I don't know, was it five or seven years ago, maybe seven years ago, I can't recall, but I went into a listing appointment. And I know I was the fifth broker for this listing appointment because they, it was like every 30 minutes they, were, they had a broker and we were, all happened to be in the lobby waiting for our turn. So I go up and again, I know I'm the last broker and I know that um, there's probably no chance because I saw the other brokers coming out of this appointment and they were um, had bigger businesses than I did. So I knock on the door, the husband answers and he said, you know, let me guess, you're the number one broker here in Chicago. You sold, you know, blah, 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 <laughs> for real estate and you did this and you did this. He's like, come on in. And I'm like, OK. And I said, well. To be honest, sir, you know, I am not the number one broker <laughs> and I'm number three and I have not sold that much real estate. But what I wanted to do, you know, Mr. And Mrs. Seller, is talk to you about your home and what I can do for you. And let's talk about you. And he looked at me, he goes, you're hired. 
And it just dawned on me and it was a very organic conversation. And I thought, you know, when he, when I told him I was number three or I didn't sell hundreds of millions of dollars of real estate at the time that I, he was just going to show me the door. But what in that, and again, this seems so easy, but I put the client first. And again, yeah. everyone knows that, but there's a difference between knowing and doing, right? When you really come from a place of authentically putting the client's needs first, not the money, not your time, but really the client, we are a fiduciary. The client feels that and they know that, right? Also in that appointment, what I learned was being prepared and having the knowledge of the market, right? I can't underestimate having knowledge and knowing the market inside and out. Because in this day and age, all of our clients know what the market's doing. There's Zillow, there's, you know, every website out there, they can research everything, you know, and it is our job to know that as well going in. So I would always say be extremely prepared on the market, but more importantly, be prepared on who your client is. Because I know I'm doing a lot of talking, but I'm an excellent listener during my during my presentations or when I'm with clients. Because again, it's their time, it's about them. But knowing a little bit about the client coming into the appointment, there's so much research we can do. LinkedIn, I mean, everything, right? You can Google the person. Are they an analytical person? You know, what what type of personality do they have? If I know I'm going into an appointment with someone who's in the financial world, world that's very data-driven, I will bring an Excel spreadsheet, I'm bringing charts, I know how to impress that person. If they're not, if they're an interior designer and they're very creative, I know that pictures are gonna say a thousand words, right? So knowing that before you go into your appointment, knowing a little bit about that client is going to, is going to win you that business. Again, you know, sellers wanna do business with people that they trust, one that they know, and that know that have their best interest at heart. I know that that was a, a rambling, rambling uh, uh, story that I told you, but um, I think what I'm trying to get across is that um, it's it's obviously always hard work, but it's putting in the time, putting in the energy, knowing your clients and knowing your market. Yeah, I, I love all of that. A couple of things that stuck out to me. One was. I was thinking about why do, why do present sometimes like listing presentation, why does that sometimes not win the business if it's not also um, accompanied by a lot of listening and a lot of questions, then it's just a presentation, right? And right. you were talking about when you sat down and won that listing that you were the fifth person and you were like, just let's talk about you and what you guys want versus launching straight into here's why I'm you know, the person to hire. I right. think, I think people want to be heard and they want to feel validated and they want really somebody that's like, I can come up with a solution for you. Tell me what you're looking for. Right. And that's essentially what you did. And I think the challenge with that for a lot of our listeners is it's a little scary to ask um, a, a consumer, like, what are you looking for? Because then we have to take that information in, we have to somehow process it in real time and then possibly try to come up with an answer right then and there, or we have to have a, I'm going to take this back to my office. I'm going to think about this. I'm going to come to you with a solution, but right. you have to sort of have that ready to go because they are going to ask a question where you might not have a ready answer. And I, so I think that's probably why a lot of times in listing presentations, people stick to their presentation because they don't have as much unknown, but I love the, the idea of coming in and, and, and basically also having a presentation, but be having, you know, like, Hey, I really want to get to know you and then I'll come to you with a solution. Right. Um, so I, I think there's something about asking questions. There's a little, can be a little scary because if they ask, if they answer in a way that you're like, I don't know what that means, then, you know, you have to sort of figure out how to proceed from there. But, but that's, I think what good, what good agents do is they listen. Um, like, like you were saying. Um, so I think that's, and I also just love the idea that how, you know, how you really built your career working with developers is you walked into a developer and you had an opinion. That's to uh -huh. me, the really interesting part is anybody can walk up and say, hi, I'm so-and-so I'd love to represent you, which by the way, is an amazing thing to do in and of itself. But then to say like, I don't think this is a good idea and here's why. 
is a very um, courageous thing to do to a developer. I yeah. Think. But it's also probably really important because a developer does want to hear what do professionals think about what I'm doing. And I just love people that are willing to state opinions because that's when I'm hiring a professional, like an accountant or an attorney or whoever, I want opinions. I'm like, what should I be doing here? Right. Uh, how does this work? I, I, I don't want to do, do all the legwork. And so I love the fact that you were able to bring another perspective. And then he was like, you know, all right, let's work together, which is well, that, which is well, that also brings up a good point. And this is, I think, important for everyone to hear this as well is, you know, it took me a while to figure out who I was as a real estate agent. Right. So when I had started, we'll call it not in the development world, but in the, you know, the general brokerage, I never had a mentor and I, I don't recommend that, but just by default, I just never did. And I don't know, I don't know why I didn't have one, but you know, it was a lot of self-taught and a lot of self-learning. But what I did do is, you know, I would look at some of the brokers that were ultra successful and just try to mimic what they were doing. And there was a point where I realized, you know, so-and-so, you know, it produces a hundred million dollars and I'm watching everything they're doing and going to their open houses and seeing it, but it wasn't working for me. You know, and I'm like, how, why is this not working? I'm doing the same thing or almost the same thing. And what I realized, again, this sounds simple, but this was my journey, was that wasn't me. I was not being authentic to who I was and what value I bring and, you know, the way I speak and the way I do things. So there was a, a point where I'm like, you know what? This is who I am. This is how I envision my business. This is how I want to treat my clients. This is how I want to advertise. This is what I want to do. And I created a business being more authentic to myself. And that's where it skyrocketed. Because when I went in to talk to someone, it wasn't a canned answer. It wasn't, like you said, the presentation of A, B, C, and D. It was a conversation. And it was my experiences in truly how I felt about everything. And again, when you, whether it's building your brand, doing your advertising, speaking, whatever it is, be authentic. And that's when people are going to see and trust you because you are you. No one else can be you except for you. Right. And and you also too, you take chances. Um, You took a chance walking up to that developer, you know, uh, right away. You take, you, you took a chance in a story. I I won't uh, give the specifics, but basically you had a deal that, that fell, that went away and at the last minute, and then you walked next door to a property that was almost identical and you were representing the seller at the Mm -hmm. previous thing. And then you're like, I, And there was an agent representing the buyer, and that was not you. And you walked next door to a seller and said, hey, they were going to buy your neighbor's home. It fell apart. Would you be interested in selling? Because I've got a buyer lined up. And and then it closed. The deal closed. And that was just because you were like, I'm going to go walk next door. They didn't know you. They didn't know anything about you. They weren't looking to sell their home. And and yet, so I love the fact that you are always thinking creatively as well. Like, how can I get this done? Um, which I think, you know, speaks to, to your success, of course. Um, just so that, ev- cause I know you carry is a very legendary status here in Chicago. Everyone just really, um, is so impressed with her, with her abilities, but I would love just to humanize you for a moment. Where do you struggle in your business? Cause we just want to make sure you, ev- not everything is perfect so we can relate better to you. Oh, nothing's ever perfect. I think that's what keeps me going and driving because, you know, there's always, ways to do things better. I would really just say time. You know, it's really something that um, I struggle with every day is, you know, having enough time, you know, talk to my clients to, you know, curate my marketing to, um, you know, get new business. So, you know, time is, is a hard one, but I would say delegating as well has always been difficult for me is I'm always a doer. I know how to do this job from beginning to end. I know how to do paperwork. I know how to, I know everything. I shouldn't say that sounded bad. Not that I know everything, but I know every attribute of this job. I've done it. Um, And so because of that too, if something comes up, I'm like, I'll just do it myself. You know, like whether it's paperwork or inspection stuff or, you know, changing light bulbs, you know, I'm just, I'm a doer, but I need to learn to delegate a little bit more on some of those tasks. Um, and I have a hard time doing that. 
delegating is tough because there, you know exactly how you like something done and it meets your standard. And then to find somebody who has a similar standard yeah. is tough. It's just yeah. tough. And, and also too, you're putting a lot of faith in their abilities. Otherwise you're micromanaging everything they do. Yes. So I totally get it because my, my boss had said this to me um, many years ago. He goes, if, if you have something you're delegating to, you almost have to be okay with it only being about 70% to your liking. In other words, like the pr- people are probably just not going to do it the way you do it. And that's hard it's to, then, hard. yeah. So you have a similar, a similar yeah. issue is... Yes, um, this is. But I created this wonderful checklist. It's from um, the time I get a listing to the time we launch it, and then from launching to closing, kind of like a step by step guide. So that it just, um, it's probably two hundred steps long, which is ridiculous. But um, it kind of ensures that you know we have a smooth process. Um, So I'm, I I'm probably borderline micromanager, but it's just my personality. Well, it's, you treat your business. So, um, you take it so seriously that it's important. Every step of that way is important because if something breaks down, one of those steps break down, it it could torch the whole thing. So I, I totally get it. Have you, uh, have you had experiences and I I know you have somebody that that helps you, but have you had experience working with like a transaction coordinator that does all of the, here's the timeline of what we're looking at as far as you know, up, 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 important events in a transaction. Have you ever used any of those services just out of curiosity? Or do you well, do everything? Well, I have, um, I have in the past, but I've hired uh, my own team. So I've yeah. got, yeah, because it's just, it's all in house so I can control quality control. Sure. Sure. Yeah. I was just, I, I, I think some of these transaction coordinators, especially for agents that it's not their strong suit, I think, you can find good ones out there. Um, they're not always easy to find, but you know, for like three or 400 bucks or whatever they charge for, uh, it seems like that would be a good, good use of time for an agent that's, you know, trying to, to handle all of that, all of those things at once. Cause you know, I think it's, it's true. Like we, we're not all good at everything. We can't be good at everything. So, right. um, so I, I love that stuff. Um, one other question is, you know, when, when there's market conditions that aren't favorable, so we still are in, you know, slightly higher interest rates than we'd like, and well, maybe more than slightly, and inventory is still not ideal. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you stay positive when there's, you know, some real challenges out there? Um, I'm always a half, a glass half full gal. I always, I'm very solution oriented as well. Um, I mean, we can't change the interest rates. It is what it is, right? (laughs) So it's just being educated on that conversation and, um, you know, giving the client a good solution, whether it's the right lender or if they're going to leverage their portfolio. Um, We can't control that. But just, again, being educated on it and letting the clients know inventory. um, I'm always creative in finding inventory. Yeah. Yeah, I imagine there's times where you have, well, we just talked about an example where you went up mm-hmm. to a seller who didn't even know they wanted to sell or yeah. weren't, you know, and you've probably done that a number of times. I, I think when people start, when agents start playing in the high net worth space or the luxury, the true luxury space, getting a listing isn't really the guarantee for a sale anymore because anybody can throw that on the MLS. And if it's a $5 million property or, or something you know really sizable, there's just not that many people waiting for a $5 million property to hit the MLS. So oftentimes the listing agent, you, know, you have to kind of go out and find the buyer as well, uh, right. I imagine. And so how do, how would you do that if you had a an ultra high net worth listing, which I know you've had, and you're like, okay, well, it's putting on the MLS isn't really going to do much because you know I need to go out and somehow market this property to people that might mm-hmm. actually be interested in buying it. Like, can you just walk through just general ideas of how people may want to? Because now, if our li- you know on the buy side things might be changing with compensation and people are a little scared about that, um, it's going to be interesting to see uh, listing agents if they are. If, if, if they start looking for buyers directly, I, I, I hope that doesn't happen. Um, but I know it, it on the high net worth side, it sort of does happen because yeah. there just aren't that many people. Yeah. So I would say it's um, my network, you know, and creating a network and which with um, everything online, it's, it's pretty easy to build an incredible network. And I would say going back again um, 
to younger agents or agents just starting the business is to create start creating a great network you know whether it's you know art dealers or wealth managers or cpas um you know price properties those are the people you want to partner with and you want to be able to pick up the phone and call them and say you know i've got a five five million dollar listing you know do you have any clients that this would fit so it's a lot more we'll call it like legwork you know right it's going back to some of the grassroots marketing um so to me it's all about networking and picking up the phone and reaching out to people and and if you didn't know who those agents were who also play in that space if you're really newer to that space i guess you could go on the mls see what kind of transactions have closed in that space and reach out to those agents be like hey i got this new listing i know you work with people like this i imagine you've made those types of calls uh, yeah. all throughout your career absolutely Speaking of that, um, I would we've talked about this before, but just in case anyone's new, I just think this is such an, a, a great idea. You have obviously been in the industry long enough where people enter your local market, leave your local market, they retire elsewhere, they buy homes, they move. And so your professional network of realtors that you refer to and from obviously is really important because of your um, because of your reputation. So you have gone out this last year, and, and I think you're still doing it now, and meeting, physically mm-hmm. traveling to these areas where you know that a lot of your people retire to or move to. And instead of just throwing a referral over knowing, well, I, I think they're pretty good. I know, you know, from what you want to actually go and meet, meet with them and see how they interact. And can you tell us a little bit about how, how that's, you know, help, been helpful to you? Oh, it's, I, you know, face-to-face meetings and getting to know people is so much different than just a phone call, right? It just, again, we build trust and relationships with our clients. We have to do with our brokers, right? So to me, it, it shows also, commitment to excellence and to how hard we work, you know, so again, when, um, you know, like in Dallas, like, you know, it was, it's, I've known these ladies down there and we've talked and I said, you know what, I'll be there on Tuesday at two. And, you know, just like the reaction of like, they're like, oh my God, that's so nice that you're coming. Well, it's important to me. Right. And so it just, it shows the importance of the relationship. So, um, and plus it gets me out of cold Chicago sometimes. (laughs) More importantly. Yeah, perfect. Um, and I'll just ask this, this one last question. So in for your business this year, is there one, aside from the production and the volume and, and all of that, what you want to do, is there any part of your process that you're looking to improve this year? Like, is there something going on that you're like, I need to make that a little bit easier or, or more yes. efficient? Yes. And I will always, there's always something just so that, you know, I'm never complacent with any process. It's always room to improve, but I would say, um, communication, um, you know, there was, someone had made this comment once and it always stuck with me. And they said that, um, you know, like if you have a significant other, you get up in the morning, you, you leave for work and, you know, maybe during the day you, you think about your significant other, you're just wondering what they're doing, but you just don't communicate and you get home late at night, you're grouchy, you go to bed, you wake up the next morning, you know, the day starts again, but you think about your significant other, but you just don't say anything. They said, that's how your clients feel. Yes. You think about the client and the property all the time, but unless you communicate with them and say something, they don't know you're thinking about them. They don't know. So, you know, it's, um, again, sometimes, and that goes back to time, you know, sometimes I just don't have time in the day and, you know, it becomes nine o'clock at night. I'm like, oh shoot, I meant to call, you know, X, Y, Z, but now it's nine o'clock at night, you know? So I send an email, which I think is a little less personal, but, um, so just a better way to communicate. And I think that's a big thing in any business that you're in. Yeah. Communication seems to be the number one reason why people stop working with an agent. So yeah. I, I, yeah, I couldn't agree more. And and again, this, I, back to like the um, significant other example, I, I've had this happen. It's really a, a great example because I've had it happen where I think about my, I don't have a significant other at the moment, but when I have had one, I think about that person a lot and I, you're right. I don't often tell them I'm thinking about them. And then all of a sudden, uh, you know, some time goes by and they're like, you, you don't really talk to me as much. And I'm like, in my mind, I'm talking to you all day. (laughs) Right. And same thing with clients, right? In my mind, I'm thinking about my client all day. And yet, you know, so what I do, I do this with my friends too. I put, I have a to do, a to do system. I use Todoist and I put, um, 
regular communication, uh, recurring events. So like all my friends are on a regular, they don't know this, but they're on a regular phone call schedule where I, for me, it's like, I don't go more than two months without calling certain people or one month or whatever. It's my parents every week, mm-hmm. whatever. So I, um, I, I think, you know, that could be done for clients as well. Like just putting it on the to-do list so that you're not just thinking about it. You're like, oh, tick off this, I did it, um, thing. So that's, that's what I've done. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's tough. It's, it's a tough, tough thing, but I, I will say, um, I have interviewed a lot of successful agents for the show and a lot of them talk about just calling their client once a week being like, like a huge step up from previous experiences they've had with realtors. Like even just that alone has been, it's like almost shocking that that's, that seems like a pretty low bar to clear, but that's, you know, kind of what's neat about this industry is not everyone's super professional. And so you can really go in and give somebody a great experience just by staying in touch. Yeah. Uh, well, I think this is a great place to wrap up, Carrie. This was really super helpful. People always ask me, how come you don't ask Carrie questions about her business? And I go, you know what? I'm going to start doing that because <laughs> people are so, so enamored with you. If everyone should uh, be enamored with, with Carrie, and please follow her on Instagram. She does all of her own social media, which is even the more impressive with how busy she is. Carrie Carrie McCormick Real Estate is where you go find her. Carrie McCormick RE.com is her website, also a beautiful website. Um, and if you think you would like to be partnered with Carrie, maybe for a transaction, somebody's moving to the Chicagoland area or away from the Chicagoland area, and you would like to maybe be one of the people that Carrie refers business to, um, you can certainly reach out to her. Carrie, what's the best way someone should reach you? Always call me, 312-961-4612. You can email me, you can Google me, you can DM me, you can text me, you can do whatever you want. I will answer. Awesome. Well, I want to thank everyone for uh, sticking around to the end of this episode. Carrie, as as usual, thank you on behalf of the audience. You provided a ton of value today. On behalf of Carrie and myself, thank you to the audience. By the way, uh, this, this isn't really going to matter to anyone but me, but we had the most number of live viewers watching as we were recording than we've ever had in our entire history today. So we had about 100 people watching live, and we don't even really promote it live, so that's even more incredible. Shows how in, how uh, popular Carrie is here on the show. So on behalf of everyone, please tell a friend. Um, think think um, of another agent that could benefit from hearing this great conversation with Carrie. Shoot him a link and hit the like and subscribe button wherever you are listening or watching us on. We appreciate it. Leave us a review. Check out our sponsors, and we will see everybody on the next episode. Thanks, Carrie. Thank you. Thank you.